we start a new series called Food from Feast to Famine. How many like food? Come on, be honest. Our, our fellow food addict friends here. And uh, we all uh, have a journey that we're going on. Uh, but really, our hope today was, as I've been studying this, Ryan and I had the opportunity to meet with a food scholar these last two weeks, uh, where she specializes in Jewish food in the community. She does archaeological digs uh, in Israel on the regular. So it was just a great experience. But as we were praying about what this journey looks like, uh, for us, we have, our, again, our three values here. And we really felt like God was highlighting community again going into the summer. And as we're talking, I, I, we share ideas. It's Bob, Ryan, and I. And then I say, you know, I want to really do it on, on the feasts and the importance of the feasts. We're coming out of Passover. Let's talk about, you know, Pentecost. And Bob says, let's call it food. And I said, Bob, let's call it food. So from there, our really our main goal is this. What does it look like to connect with the family of God and to reorient the appropriate place of how food play, plays a role in our culture? where our culture has such a weird relationship with food. We're either on a diet or we're addicted to it. We don't know this common ground where we're able to look at food as God's provision to us as a means of celebration and connection. For many of us, it's become this thing of opulence, opulence and fascination, or we try to avoid it at all costs. What's the balance? What's the harmony here? You know, when we look at words that are significant in the Bible, you think of words like salvation and righteousness. Just the word food is mentioned nearly 400 times in the Bible. Just the word food. Not the allusions to it, not the feast elements, not the literal grapes and bread, just the word food. It's something that's so important that for some reason in the Western world, we don't know how to talk about it. Because our relationship has been so fractured with it. So our goal over this series is to reopen what it looks like to receive the provision of God in natural means, like our food, and to celebrate with community. So our goal these first two weeks is I'll set up one premise, and then Ryan will set up the other premise, and this will help anchor kind of our discussion. Because the moment you start talking about food, we get all defensive. How many are out there like, well, you don't know my journey, my journey or my story. You know, that's kind of how we go. Or you don't know what happened to me here or what I like here. The goal today is not to have a list of prohibitions of what you should and should not eat. That's not the win. The win is, what does it look like to steward what God has given us? What does it look like to steward how God has made us? And that will be the goal today. If you're looking at the time, you're right. I will not be able to nail the content today. Uh, I'll probably have to do kind of a split message of 9 and 11. Um, so I may have both online today uh, regarding what we're talking about. Now, this morning, uh, there's going to be a lot of Scripture density, but I don't want you just flipping it in your Bibles or flipping on your phone. Uh, because the goal of today, and really how you look at the first century, it was an oral culture. They weren't reading written scrolls to the body of Christ. So with that being said, I'm going to go nearly over 40 passages of Scripture, not verses, but passages. So I will just reference some of them, and then we'll make those notes available next week, either on the app or through email, so that you can do their own study with them and some of the scholars I've worked with. Because if, if you did this today, we would just be reading for the next 35 minutes. So that's not our goal. I want to tell a little bit of story form. So just track with me, and you'll see the connection here in a minute. Do me a favor. Turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9. So you can anchor here. We'll be in this one for a little while. So Genesis chapter 2. It says this, then we'll pray. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing morning. Lord, many of us here are summer addicts. And uh, when we saw it raining today, it was not our happiest moment, me being included. So God, we just repent of those attitudes where we think we know what's best. God, you know what's best. You know what our ground needs. You know what our soil needs. 
You know what our culture needs. And Lord, as we come today, we choose to give you lordship. We say that you're king, that you're the boss. You're the one we love. But you're not just a dictator. You're not just a leader. You're a father that cares. And God, I just pray that your grace would fill this house. As many are here and they're tired and they're burdened and they're facing difficulty that we may not be able to touch on today. God, we just pray for your healing power and your strength to come. And just with eyes closed, you're in a place right now in your life where you need God to move in a significant way, either with healing or provision. Lift your hand up right now. Father, we just pray and you provide for this family, that you'd meet them in their area of need and difficulty, where there's been fracturing of relationships, where there has been marriages in dire straits, Lord, as there's been finances that are just in the red. God, we thank you that you are a good God. We declare your goodness. We raise a hallelujah in Jesus' name. In the midst of our difficulty, we say that you are good and your love endures forever. So, Father, would you come and fill this house with with fresh hope, with vision? Would you meet every need specifically in this moment? In Jesus' name, everybody said Amen. Say, keep your head up. Turn the person next to you. Say, keep your head up. Come on. There we go. So right now in present day, we live in the greatest culture of convenience that humanity has ever known. Just think about your moment, your your morning routine. Many of us, you wake up. Some of you, it may have been light outside for a long time. Others, Wake up before the dawn and before the light. Aaron now knows that reality with this crying child. But we wake up, and you just think about this routine. For many of us, it may look like this. You wake up, it's dark outside. You go over to the kettle or your coffee maker and press on. Thank you, Jesus, for the provision of caffeine. You then walk over to your shower. You turn it on, piping hot. Steam fills that mirror that is in your room, you turn a light on. This is our momentary routine. Our morning routine is we walk to a cabinet. You may grab a muffin. You may grab things from your your freezer that makes a smoothie. And this is how we start our day. And when you see your friends or relatives and you go to work, you often ask how your morning was. But when you think about the morning of a first century believer, it was very different than how we live today. If you wake up in the morning, we don't flip on a light switch back then. You have to light a fire. When you wake up in the morning, you don't turn on a kettle. You start a fire and you boil this kettle of water. And then you make your way out to this forest, to this field. And I don't know what it is, but we have such a culture of convenience. However, there is one convenient thing all of us do that seems seemingly more difficult. And I would say maybe as hard as our ancestors lived. And that is shopping at Costco. We have within us, in our DNA, this desire to forage and to fight and to find our preservation. And I don't know what it is, but the moment you cross that threshold of Costco, our primal self comes out. Have you noticed this? You're there, and and, and again, if you have faith, and I grew up in this environment, you begin to pray for a parking spot. You know you do, by the way. And you're there, and you're like, Lord Jesus, provide a parking spot that's close. And then you wait in those narrow lanes. I can't stand it when they all go in one direction, and you go down the wrong way, or someone else does. You lose your salvation in those moments, if you know what I'm talking about. Like, how dare you not follow the arrows? But then you're finally there in the two-way lot, and this, this person puts their parking lights on, and they begin to back out. And you're like, the Lord has provided this space. And as they back out, they're too close to you, so you have to back further away. And then that person comes down the other lane, and you're like, no, they won't. And then you're like, they better see my blinkers on. And then you put your blinker on, and then you realize they're on the other side, so you put like your hazard lights on. And they're there, and they pull up, and they pretend like they don't see you. You know that death stare, that ghosted stare of like, just keep turning, just keep turning, just keep turning. And then you just pray a hallelujah over them as you drive by. You find your spot. You walk out, and there is this kind of convergence looking for these carts at Costco. And as you're there, and you walk up to this cart, and you pull it out, and then you're angry because someone else left wrappers or trash inside of that cart. 
And you're like, I ain't picking that up. I don't know where that napkin's been. And then you discard that cart over to the side. And you say to yourself, someone else needs to handle this. And then you grab your cart. Because I have kids, right? And so because I have kids, it excuses any, you know, malicious behavior I have. So we're in there, and then you go through this pipeline of different deals and coupons, and you just try to keep your head down, because you know you're going to buy something that you never set out to purchase at this place. And as you're looking down, you're like, oh, a suntan lotion dispenser. I've always, no, keep focused. <laughs> keep focused. An infrared thermometer, keep focused. But it's $10 off, keep focused. Because you're making it all the way to the greatest thing that Costco provides, free samples. <laughs> and you make it to this free sample station. And again, I stopped eating free samples a long time ago. I mean, honestly, they weren't things that I, I tend to enjoy. But they are the great silencer of your children. And when you're there and your kids are ravaged, that's the only reason why your kids would even go to Costco with you. You put them in there, and you're like, there's samples. And my, kid, my boys, this one day, my boys are so set for these samples. So we're there, and there's this chicken ravioli. And my sons, like, duh, duh, my, my younger son, Kingston, he has this deep voice. He has a paralyzed vocal cord. and just makes him sound like he has an awesome radio voice. Dad, dad, I want a sample. Right? So he walks over, and he's like, dad, I want the, I want the pasta. So we go over to the pasta, and... And Kingston, Kingston's there, and Justice is there. Justice eats it right away. Well, I give it to Kingston, who's like, hot, Dad, hot. And, he's, and I'm like, okay. So I go to blow on it, but it's, it's this weird ravioli shape. So I, I take a bite of this ravioli to blow on it, and half of it slips down my throat, and I choke on it. And it locks in my throat cavity. Now, I have this, this throat condition that, as I would say, I don't have, but I'm being healed of. Thank you, Chris and Liz Linda. I'm being healed of this throat condition, and it's a mouthful. It's called eosinophilic esophagitis. So what happens is my throat will spasm on certain things I eat. So it goes down, and, I, and the unique thing is I can talk when I have this episode. So it's down the, the, the top part of my chest cavity. So I'm there. I'm like, oh, no, it's happened, and it's, it's like lodged in. Well, not to get too graphic, I have to induce a gagging response. So I start to do it, my dad, and my son Justin's like, Dad, you're choking, Dad? Dad, you're choking. I'm like, I'm not choking. Don't stop saying that. People are gonna go, Dad's choking, Dad's choking. <laughs> so there's sample lady, like, oh my gosh, this is I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Don't heimlich me, I'm fine. <laughs> um, and I'm trying to like duck for cover. So if you've noticed at Costco, there's this trick. You have the center aisles where everybody is. This, the trick to Costco is to go on the outer rim. I don't know if you know this, but you want to survive Costco, you go to the outer rim. I know, I, I know, now it's gone, right? Everybody's going to go after this. So we're on this outer rim, and there's these trash cans every bit along the way. So I, I don't want to make a scene, so I have to go over to a trash can and try to induce a gagging response. So my son, Kingston, has a gag reflex. And he hears this, he's like, Dad, Dad, stop throwing up, Dad. I'm like, I'm not throwing up. He goes, uh, uh, all right. And so now I have this puking son, this other one that wants to call 911, and I have this chicken ravioli lodged in my chest cavity. So I'm trying to make it down, and I'm trying to call Rachel. I'm like, if I just, because I don't want to, you don't abandon the cart at Costco. You know, it's the threat that every parent has. We'll leave this cart right now. And you're like, dear Lord, let them calm down. I don't want to leave this cart. So I'm like, I can't leave the cart. I make it through the lane. I call Rachel. I like, Rachel, I have an episode. She's like, okay, can you get home? I'm like, I can get home. Well, I can't drink water. Because if I drink water, it sits on top of it. So I get home. I'm doing everything I can to get this out. My kids are now freaking out. Like, Dad's going to die. And look, I'm not going to die. I could talk to you. Well, as we're there, I have to test it. And I have to drink some water. So I drink some water, and it sits on top of my throat. So now I am choking. So I wave over to Rachel. She's you know, slapping my back. And I'm, I'm like, she's like, go to the ER. I'm like, I'm not going to the ER. She's like, go to the ER. I'm in my living room. I'm doing yoga poses, trying to get out like downward dog and salutation of the sun and like all this stuff, right? And she's like, go to the doctors. So I'm not going to the doctors. She's like, go to the doctors. I was like, no, I'm not going to the doctors. And she finally says, it's not about you. And when there's just those words that your wife can say 
you're like, you're right. Altar call right now, right? So I'm like, it's not about me. Because I realize that what's happening to me affects everyone. What's happening to me in that moment is affecting everyone. So I go to this ER, and they have to induce me, and I have to have this throat surgery. And it turns out that my throat at that time was so small. The normal throat is about 18, I think it's uh, millimeters in diameter. Mine was eight. So, and it's lodged in, so they have to stretch and expand my throat. It's this dramatic thing. And they, they walk away, and they say, you know, we have to do a lot more testing. Something's wrong. And I walked away that day, and I could breathe again, and by God's grace, I was okay. But I knew that something was wrong with my body. And for a lot of us, we live in this state of crazy, where you've tried everything you can. And I look back at my life. I had my devotional life. I ate well. I exercised all the time, but my body didn't feel right. Something was off. And when we look at our modern culture, that has every convenience that kings never had in history's past. We all identify these conveniences are not the cure. These conveniences we have, we find ourselves getting sicker than we've ever been. Now, the common argument is, well, we live longer. Our greatest gift of life provision and the why our life expectancy is expanded is the modern childbirthing techniques that we've learned. The reason why mortality was so low in the first century was because mom would die in childbirth and so would the child. So the moment we solved these things, the second element is the moment we discovered modern dentistry, we stopped dying of tooth disease. So our life expectancy goes up. So we assume modern medicine has made us live longer when the reality is a few innovations have. And as now we live longer, we may be living longer, but we're living in more pain and sickness than anyone else has experienced because we have medicine available and it's not working. We have modern medicine in our hands and we're sicker than we've ever been. Here's an infograph of the modern child and the threats that they're born into. Now, a lot of us, we look at people that aren't well and we assume, well, they should have been better stewards of their life. You ever have that judgment come on you? Where you look at someone and are like, well, if they would have done this and this and this, what about the child that's born into it? What about the child that's born into this thing? Are we to blame them because they're born with asthma? They have child cancer. They have food allergies. They have ADHD. They have epilepsy and seizures. They have autism, juvenile diabetes. We're, we're raised in this culture and there's this deck that's now stacked against humanity. When we look at the stats of where common culture is, there's 100 million people in the U.S. that are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. 100 million people. One in five have an anxiety disorder. 39% when you're born, there's a 39% chance you'll have cancer. There's a problem happening. And culture's trying to answer, how do we fix this crisis? And as I study, and as I read, and as I hear theories, I can't help but to go back to that place that I was introduced in Sunday school. The narrative that makes the most sense is a place called Eden. See, when God makes creation, and we have this cosmological dance that takes place, and we have this symphony of creation, we then have this unique role, unlike any other creation story, this God of the Jews actually has a relationship with his creation. So what we have to understand is when this would be read or this would be shared to a Gentile who did not know the Jewish history and story, the, the, the audacity of this story is that this God, Yahweh, actually wants to have relationship with his creation. Because every other creation myth says that mankind is a nuisance. Every other story says that humanity is a problem to the gods. Yet there's this God that desires relationship with his creation. Genesis 2.15. And God placed the man in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. 
verse 16. And the Lord commanded him and said, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it, for if you do, you'll die. So we have this provision that this God has created. And he says, anything is yours in abundance, except there's one prohibition. You can't eat of this tree, because if you do, there's going to be death that takes place. So now, when we often think of the garden, you may think of a Thomas Kincaid painting. How many are out there? Or you think of this flannel graph set that I saw when I was a child at six. We have different images of garden. But here's the unique thing. If I were to hear this story as a Jew, the image that comes to my mind is not agriculture, it's temple. This is what they would think of. When they hear garden, they think temple. Here's what one scholar writes. Genesis 1 and 2 describe to anyone with first century eyes the construction of the ultimate temple. The single heaven and earth reality, the one cosmos within which two realities, God's space and our space, come together. The seven stages of creation are the seven stages of constructing a temple into which the builder will come, take up residence, and take his rest. So when they would hear the story of the garden and the creation story that they would tell, they see it as God building a temple with agriculture. That's what it is. And here's this man named Adam that is there to tend and to keep it. So there's some great work that's been done as of late, because I know whenever I bring up these things in our times, you get very like, okay, what wild story is he about to tell? Or diatribe is he about to make up? With that being said, a lot of scholarly research has been done to understand that the temple that we read about in Chronicles and Kings and all the Gospels, it's a shadow of Eden. And they follow this model of creation. So this one man named Gregory Beale created this elaborate scholarly study. There's a long article that we will not do laboriously today. But he takes 10 points of Eden and temple, and he breaks it down. And I've consolidated it down to three points to help give us a perspective as to why Eden and temple are cohesive. Number one, Eden was a place of provision as the temple was a place of provision. So what do we see? It says that God places man in the garden and he provides this tree of life. So when you have this temple, it's now emulating what the provision of the garden looks like. Here's what the scholar says, the tree of life itself was probably the model for the lampstand placed directly outside the Holy of Holies. Israel's later temple had wood carvings which gave it a garden-like atmosphere and likely were intentional reflections of Eden. When we think of a menorah, you may think of Hanukkah. Here's what the menorah would have looked like. It was this massive gold candlestick. And you would light it with these seven elements. Again, think of the seven stages of creation that Genesis 1 and 2 walk through. And what's the major statement in Genesis 1? In the beginning, God created and said, let there be what? Light. And they would go through this practice of lighting this temple menorah. They would light it as this tree of life emulated light. It was to demonstrate that God provides light and life to humanity. It goes forward and says this. The second element of temple and garden is a place for God's presence. What do we notice with Adam? As he creates Adam and forms him with his hands, it says he breathes into his nostrils. He breathes. It means it's literally the word emphasize, emphaseo. It's this emphasis. He has this creation, and he puts his presence inside of him. From there, he then says that he would walk in the garden is what Adam would do. As Adam would walk in the garden, Genesis 3.8, we're all familiar with this, and they heard the sound of God walking in the garden, and they hid. The presence of God was a regular occurrence in Genesis, in Eden. So as the presence is there, as they would walk with God, the same phrase is used to describe the presence of God in the temple. Then when the glory of God would come in, it literally gives the image of God walking in the temple back and forth. This is this temple narrative. 
Lastly, the temple was a place of preservation. So what do we have? We have Adam that is called to tend and to keep, to guard this garden. And as he guards this garden, he's to steward it. Now, when the priests are put in charge of this temple that they create, they're given the same words that God gives Adam in Genesis 2 to serve and to tend it, to protect it. And one of their main stewardships is to protect the temple from anything that's unclean. Because if uncleanness comes in, it will defile the temple. And now we see in Leviticus, how many had Leviticus as their morning reading today? No, probably not. As we read in Leviticus, there's all these prohibitions, and there's these long lists of things that will defile someone in the nation of Israel. Leviticus 11.42 says this, Whatever moves on its belly and whatever moves on all fours, whatever has many feet, all the creatures that swarm upon the earth, you shall not eat, for they are detestable. They bring defilement. This word swarm and team that's used here includes numerous creatures, including snakes. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And the serpent was craftier than any other creature. And the serpent comes into the garden, into the temple. For a lot of us, when we read this story, we think original sin is eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. To a Jew, when they hear this, it's because Adam let the temple get defiled. Here's what Beale writes, when Adam fails to guard the temple by sinning and letting in the unclean serpent to defile the temple, Adam loses his priestly role. And the two cherubim take over the responsibility of guarding the garden temple. Adam's there. The story and the narrative is Adam sees the serpent come in. He allows it. It seduces Eve. And then Adam eats the fruit of it. He's there the whole time. The guardian of the garden lets it go forward without his protection. He forfeited his priestly role. It's a big deal. So what happens? They remove them from the garden in Genesis 3, verse 24, and two cherubim come. A lot of us think there's this angel with this flaming sword. It's they came. So there's this plural cherubim that come, and there's this flaming twirly sword that happens. It's unique. We can't describe it. Well, from here, we have this journey of broken covenant, but God makes covenant again with Abraham. Genesis 15, Genesis 17. We then have this unique family that is one of the most dysfunctional families in the Bible, if you've read the story. We have Isaac, and then we have Jacob, and we have all these sons that are trying to murder Joseph. Well, they stumble into Egypt, and as they're in Egypt, it says that Joseph is clothed with authority, and he's brought up to the second most powerful position next to Pharaoh. A famine hits. As they're in the midst of this famine, they bring them there and they preserve the nation of Israel, this covenanted people with God. Well, we all know the story. Pharaoh forgets. Several hundred years go by. Captivity happens. As they're captive, God raises up a deliverer that speaks out of a burning bush, a burning garden. And as he speaks to him, he says, I've sent you. My name is Yahweh. Go back to my people and set them free. And as he comes there and he declares, let his people go, we know the Exodus story, but now we have millions of people in a desert. What do you do with this? Little provision, little grace. What happens? They go to this mountain called Sinai and fire and smoke. Angels show up. It's a crazy scene. And Moses says, no one can touch the mountain because you'll die. It's holy. As he goes up, he receives the commandments, brings down this Torah, but he's given this instruction. He says, build a tabernacle, build a dwelling place, a tent that I can rest in. So Moses builds this tent, and here's a picture of what the tabernacle may have looked like. So you have this holy of holies, you have this place. And what one scholar says is, this tabernacle would move around, but we have to ask the question, was it the tabernacle that moved or earth that moved around it? It's this place where heaven and earth meet. 
This one wild place where the presence of God can actually rest. When David takes the throne, he says, I need to build a house for my God. And this prophet Nathan says, you can't build it. Your hands are defiled. But your son can, and his throne will go on forever. Very strange prophecy. Solomon then builds this elaborate temple. We don't have a picture of Solomon's temple, but here's a picture of Herod's temple to give you a little bit of a glimpse. It's this massive place. And he builds this temple, and what happens when they build the temple? The glory of God, the kabod of God comes in. And as this glory is there and fills it with smoke and fire and presence, they fall before their father. They fall before Yahweh. And as they're there and they worship this God, they break covenant with him again. They start to defile their people. They start to worship idols. And then we have these prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah that warn them, well, eventually, Ezekiel says, the glory is going to leave if you don't get it right. So he has this vision, Ezekiel 10 verse 5. And it says that the glory was in the temple and the two cherubim that guarded it were there. It says, this is the sound of the Lord God Almighty. As Amy Grant made it famous in 1982, El Shaddai. So this phrase of God, that he's the Almighty, he's the sovereign, is there. Well, in Ezekiel 10, the cherubim take the glory of God from the temple. And we never see the glory return. Herod then rebuilds the temple in like late B.C., As he builds it, he wants to be this Messiah. He's not even Jewish. He's made king of the Jews, and the Jews reject him. Well, out of nowhere, this rumor of this carpenter's son named Jesus happens. He says he's a Messiah. Now, when you read the Gospels, they're pretty cohesive. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then you have this wild gospel called John. Why we ask new believers to read John, I have no idea. It's really one of the most confusing texts we have if you're not Jewish. When John writes his amazing prologue, which is considered by secular authors to be one of the most brilliant pieces of writing, John chapter 1, he says, And this word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word that John uses for this gospel is tabernacle. He says, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He's giving us a hint as to what the new temple looks like. Genesis 151, we then have Nathan, who's this prophet, you know, he's this young guy and he gets convinced and Jesus goes to him and says this strange phrase, you will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, some of us know the Old Testament well, and you're like, well, that's Jacob's ladder. The one place where angels rested was the temple. Jesus says he's the temple of God. John chapter 2. Destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. Speaking of his body. Strange language and behavior. Fast forward. The presence of God happens. Jesus is brought to the cross. John 19, a phrase many of us are familiar with. It is finished. We hear that phrase and we think to ourselves, oh, it's talking about the covenant. John uses the same phrase of Genesis 2, and God finished creation and rested on the Sabbath. He's tying in the temple garden narrative. And as it says that God rested, Jesus says, it's finished. He then goes, and we know is raised from the dead, but capture this. Mary goes to the tomb. And what does she see? Two angels to an empty tomb. What covered the presence of God at the Ark of the Covenant? Here's a picture of the covenant. It was two angels or two cherubim that covered it. The tomb is empty. 
The angels are there. She turns around and says, Jesus' body is stolen. She turns around and hears a voice, and she thinks it's the gardener. John says a new Adam has shown into town. There's a new Adam among us. He then meets the disciples and breathes on them and says, receive the Spirit. Same word that Yahweh uses in Genesis 2 to give them emphasis. Yahweh's now come and creating a new creation. And as he's here, he says, wait in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Now we hear that. It's people that believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We're like, yeah, give us power. This is what's unique. The word clothed there is only used a few times. And it has to do with giving someone authority. Well, Mark uses it. And it says this, and Jesus was stripped naked and they clothed him with these human robes. Capture this. The only other time that's used like that is when, get this, Adam and Eve recognize they're naked. Genesis 3.21. And God creates a sacrifice and clothes them with the animal skin. When Jesus says, I'm going to clothe you with power from on high, he removes the shame of nakedness from humanity, bears it upon himself, and returns the glory of creation to humanity. And as they wait in this place and they pray and they fast, these tongues of fire blow in. On which day? Pentecost Sunday, which celebrates the day that fire visited Mount Sinai. And these mini temples stumble out with tongues. All this to this point. Paul then has the audacity to say to a weird church named the Corinthians, who are all about the gifts of the Spirit. He says this, Don't you self know that you are temples of the Holy Spirit? And you are not your own. Therefore, honor and glorify God with the temple of your body. My friends, the reason why a subject like this is important is we're called to tend the temple, called us. The reason why we must steward our temples well is because the presence of God lives in you. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you, and he needs you humble, healthy, he needs you hungry for him. And unless if we steward these temples well, we will not be able to fulfill the purpose of God that he's intended us to live out. We have to ask the question, this is not about food. As my wife told me that day when I was choking, it's not about you. You're not your own. And when Paul uses you, it's plural to mean us. We're the temple of God. And your journey of tending the temple is communal, not individual. We're in this together. But our question today is, what serpent is slithering in your garden? What things have you allowed in your life that are dividing you between your relationship with God and stewarding what he's given you? Do we have time to go into this as much as we would love to? No. But today, let's stand together and pray for this. Let's close your eyes with me. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for this amazing day that is as full as full can be. But God, when we come to this moment and point to understand that you came as a new tabernacle, as you came to bring a new creation, as you came to call us your people, you filled us with your presence. God, would you help this community tend their temples? God, would you help us to steward the creation that you've given us and allow us to be good stewards, healthy people, humble people, hungry for you? Holy Spirit, I pray right now, that just with eyes closed, God, you would identify any serpent in our life, any defiling thing, defiling thought, Anything that's been a part of us that we need to let go, roots of bitterness and fear, addiction. God, we declare today that as your temples and people of God, you will sanctify us and make us whole. 
So Holy Spirit, would you help us? Would you sustain us? We just want to invite the prayer team forward right now. If you're one of our leaders here, could you please come forward? Father, we just ask that you bring freedom and hope. But just with eyes closed, you see, you know what? I've identified a serpent in my garden. I've identified something in my life that God wants to bring healing to. Just lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we just pray. Give us wisdom on what healing and freedom looks like. In the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, amen.